Okay, it's um, it's twelve thirty, so we'll we'll make a start. So can I um, welcome uh, everybody to to today's meeting of the Norfolk and Waveney um, Clinical Commissioning Group. Um, my name is Dr. Anup Desi, uh, and I will be chairing the meeting today. Um, this meeting is not being broadcast live, uh, but it is being recorded, and it will be available to watch on the CCG website after the meeting. Members of the public have been invited to join the meeting and to watch the meeting live. Uh, and I understand we have had uh, three or so uh, members of the public uh, who've asked uh, to attend the meeting. Um, so can I, can I welcome them to the meeting? Um, we would be grateful if members of the public can turn off their microphones uh, and cameras during the meeting. There will be an opportunity for members of the public who are watching the meeting live to ask questions about uh, any items on the agenda or to ask for clarification if they are uncertain of anything that is being discussed in the meeting. This can be done by raising your hand at the slot uh, at the meeting um, for the question in um, being considered or to raise your hand if questions are invited by me uh, chairing the meeting. Members of the public can also raise questions by email during the meeting uh, and the email address is nwccg.contactus at nhs.net. Um, if the question relates to an agenda item then it will be read out uh, at the end of the meeting. The governing body will then either answer the question or defer the answer, in which case a response will be prepared, will be prepared in writing um, to the requester within seven days of the meeting. And the answer will also be set out on the CCG website. Um, so a reminder that the governing body meeting of the CCG is being held in public, but it's not a public meeting. Um, accordingly, any questions which are not relating to the agenda items will be answered and displayed on the website, um, but would not be read out during the meeting. Um, so um, hopefully you've got your um, agenda in front of you um, and we'll, we'll make a start. Um, we're on item one um, and um, I need to make you aware of uh, chair's actions and you've got the action log uh, as it stands uh, in the papers. And since our last meeting, I have had to um, make a decision uh, under chair's action on one item, which uh, is set out in the papers, which was to approve a, 70, uh, a section 75 agreement on children's and young people's speech and language therapy. Um, we did at the last meeting agree the process for chair's action, which includes um, me, myself, consulting with uh, our chief officer um, and one uh, lay member and clinical member of the governing body, which I, which I did on this occasion with Mark uh, Jeffries and Dr. Hilary Byrne. Um, so you've, you've seen the chair's action. Uh, I'm happy to take any comments on that, but that action was, was taken um, since our last meeting. OK, um, so item two, apologies. We've had apologies from Claire Hambling. Um, I think everybody else is uh, is here who's on the governing body. I can't see anybody else missing unless somebody wants to remind me. Uh, but I think that's the only apology we've had. OK. Um, item three is declarations of interest. Um, so firstly, you know, a reminder that it's important to keep the register accurate uh, and up to date. Um, and also a, um, that if there are items during the meeting where you, uh, you feel that there may be or may be perceived to be a conflict of interest, can you make me aware during the meeting uh, of any potential conflicts that you, that you do have? Um, one of the um, issues that came up which um, I was made aware of just a couple few days ago was that, uh, that that Rob contacted me in relation to a family member being um, being a vaccinator for the uh, for the COVID vaccination program, um, which I think was a really helpful um, uh, 
for, for Rob to, to bring that up. Firstly, in relation to is, is it something that should be declared as a conflict of interest? And having discussed it with Karen, uh, I think I think it should be because I think the general principle is that if there's any any doubt, it's best to declare because actually, uh, if, if you think about it, really, it's best to put it down. Uh, and then there's no question about uh, about things not being declared. Um, and on that front, I think it's made me reflect as well that, uh, you know, and, and I realise that my, my own wife has has become a, a vaccinator, although she's not actually vaccinated yet. So I, so I will declare that uh, as, uh, as something that is a potential conflict of interest. And so, so I'll make sure that goes on the register. And I think uh, Kathy Branson has told us before that she herself is a vaccinator as well, which is on the, is on the register. So just a reminder for people, really, not just in relation to vaccinations, but other things as well. And um, um, and after the discussion I had with Karen earlier, I hope to declare also that my wife uh, is a vice chair of uh, Blowfield Parish Council, uh, which I'm very proud of her doing that. But uh, potentially there may be a conflict there in future. So I'll put that on the register as well. Um, so so uh, I haven't been uh, advised of any other conflict unless people want to declare any at this stage, but just a reminder to keep the interest uh, up to date. OK, so um, the next we need to uh, approve the, uh, the the minutes of the last meeting which we held. Um, um, just going to work my right way up to it. So that was in on the 26th of January. Um, to firstly to ap approve and if there are any uh, matters of accuracy or indeed of any matters arising, um, can we just quickly uh, go through? Uh, I mean, uh, so are, are there are there any items? Uh, I, mean, I can take it page by page if there are. Yeah, Doris. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, it was just just a comment. I think there were a couple um, uh, of. Uh, in the in the minutes that refers to I am and she said, I, I was just wondering whether the minutes could just be um, uh, made less personal, so so that when somebody reads it in six months' time, it still makes sense. Okay. So so shall shall we make so as an action shall we shall we amend those to I mean do you I mean do you want to go through individual things or, or, or no. can I ask perhaps for you to point out those particular things that need changing in terms of the grammar and the reference to individuals, a person, you know, first person or second person. I, I, I can email Jane or Karen afterwards. Thank yeah, you. okay, great. Um, John. Thanks, Anoop. Just a, a minor typo, but I think it's quite important in terms of the public record. So on page eight of the minutes, which is page 17 of the pack, but page eight of the minutes, the third paragraph from the bottom, it says TW commented on the, it should say underserved, but it says undeserved. At the Unders moment. A slightly yes, quite, context, a, quite, think, quite a difference. <laughs> yeah, so underserved. Yeah, I'm sure that's what uh, Tracy, you, you said, isn't it? Yes, it certainly was, underserved. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for that, John. Um, so any, any other matters uh, of accuracy on the rest of the paper? Or the, the minutes of the last meeting and are there any any matters arising which we're not covering otherwise on the agenda no? okay so with the with with that uh, one amendment and the um undertaking to just change the change the grammar around first and second person particularly um we'll approve those minutes um and we'll move to um the action log uh and the only, um, I mean, there's, there's two items on there, aren't there? Um, so, Karen, um, do you want to, so the governance handbook, um, I mean, it was, the last report was that because of the pressures, um, it was sort of postponed. Is that still the, still, is that still the case? Yes, um, so the work has um, been completed, but it was a case of uh, prioritising the right things on the governing body agenda time uh, this time. Um, but we're hopeful uh, of making some more time for the on the agenda in, in May uh, for this. OK, thank you. Uh, and number 12 was Doris, you'd raised a question around the flu vaccine being rolled out um, to the wider group. Uh, and we said we'd have a um, 
an overview of the, vac of the vaccination programme at this meeting, which obviously we will be discussing um, the, 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 the status of the, of the vac uh, vaccination programme. But I think the action uh, that's been recorded is that we're going to be having a full full update uh, in, in May. Are you, is it, is, yes. are, you happy, are you happy with that? That, that has been uh, reviewed again by Kath Byford, Chief Nurse, um, and we'll have more information to give a fuller update uh, at the May meeting. OK, OK, that's great. Thank you. Um, so in that case, we'll move to item six, uh, which is um, Chief Officer's update. And uh, if we can ask Mel Melanie to talk to her report. Thank you, Anoop. And um, hi, everyone. It's really good to see you all um, this afternoon. I, I just wanted to just um, maybe focus on a few things in my report, which uh, we haven't come covered elsewhere on the agenda. So there's a, you'll see that there's a main agenda item around the pressures in the system, which Mark Burgess and Jossie are going to talk through, and Kath is also going to talk through um, an, an item on the vaccination programme. Um, so I won't focus on them, just to say that they continue to, as you would expect, absorb a significant amount of planning, time and commitment from all of the CCG staff. It's a major part of all that we're doing at the moment. But I'm really pleased to say that, uh, on, particularly on the vaccination programme, as you'll hear some, from Kath, it's going incredibly well. And we are certainly shifting our attention and focus onto restoration and planning and John Ingham our chief financial officer is going to talk through in more detail that work which will be in very very important and we have now since this paper was drafted actually received the planning guidance for uh, 21 22 um, and it's important that we do shift our focus so that we are restoring and, uh, and, and looking after all of the needs of our population. Uh, we've had a very um, extreme year that we've just been through with the, the focus that we've had to have. But aside from that, I wanted to just um, really just pick out some key points from the ICS section within, within the report, because I think since the last meeting, um, NHS England have published um, their response to um, becoming an integrated care system. And we are, like all areas of the country now, making plans, building on all of the, the work that we've done over the last two to three years to work in a more collaborative and more integrated way, working as more of a single team, not just both within the NHS, but a single team effect with social care partners and the voluntary sector and district councils as well and I mean very much so which is what's um, I think borne so much benefit over this past year of uh, managing the Covid pandemic this is a natural progression um, to become an integrated care system and working in that single team approach because after all that's what people experience what they want what we know that people want they want to feel as if they're being looked after by a team rather than lots of different different teams. So planning continues um, at pace for uh, becoming an integrated care system subject to, of course, successful transition of the legislation through Parliament, which we understand the second reading of the bill will now be uh, at the towards the end of May, June. So quite a, a, a faster time scale and that we would then become an integrated care system under that new legislation in April 22. Of course, Norfolk and Waveney was designated an integrated care system under the existing Health and Social Care Act. And we would we will therefore call ourselves Norfolk and Waveney Health and Care Partnership an integrated care system from April 21. But we're acting without statutory responsibility and the, the, the power that we would have um, from April 22. Uh, and on that, in fact, the ICS has its first meeting in public on the 8th of April, uh, just in, in a couple of couple of weeks. But as more guidance uh, becomes clearer and our planning increases, we will, of course, keep the governing body up to date around all of that. But I think overall, um, it, the, the ICS 
uh, legislation and the NHS England's response has been re received very positively by, by the service. I think just a, a couple of other final things I wanted to talk about the um, Queen Elizabeth Hospital Leadership Summit, which I was very pleased to be invited to speak at a few weeks ago. I think the Queen Elizabeth have done an incredible job um, improving some of the challenges they had two years ago and some of the quality improvements. They have made dramatic and significant progress, but very importantly, progress around their uh, leadership, their culture and their staff engagement, which is so, Im so important. And I was very pleased to be invited to speak about that. Um, staff and staff's health and well-being is our single biggest priority in the NHS, and that's certainly are the single most important priority for me within Norfolk and Waveney. In particular, building on all that people have been through and what they've committed to and the sacrifices people have made over this past year. Um, and I was very pleased that there was such a strong focus on that in the Leadership Summit. To finish then, following on from that point, I'm very pleased to announce that Dr Hilary Byrne has agreed very kindly to take on the role of the wellbeing guardian for the CCG. Thank you very much indeed, Hilary. Really looking forward to working with you and for your support for this important role. Um, the staff involvement group that we have, who, which is the uh, nucleus of all of the staff engagement and the, the, the thinking around health and wellbeing for the organisation, are delighted um, to have your involvement in that. It is very, very important that we put a number of things in place to support staff as they've had to work in such different ways over this last year, working from home, which has brought a uh, number of challenges for many people um, and also often staff being redeployed. And what staff have told us that they needed over that past year is, of course, now changing to what they now need going going forward. Um, and we continue to have continue to have an active conversation with staff about people's needs, what what they what would help them the most to stay as as healthy as possible to to, to be the best that they can in their job. Um, and there are a number of, of things that we've done over the past year, including uh, lots of dedicated wellbeing sessions from a specialist GP from Nottinghamshire, which have been very well received by staff. We've benefited nationally within the NHS of having a number of um, tools and techniques, lots of apps made available for staff to improve their sleep and their mental health as well. I think what we've heard very recently uh, a lot from staff is just the single biggest factor that's affecting them is the workload pressure. So trying to support staff to manage their workload and um, ease that, that pressure on them it remains a very, very key priority. Of course, the pressure for the staff who weren't deployed was really intensified, having to keep the show on the road, if you like, whilst many of their colleagues were rightly deployed to frontline roles. We're now recalling all of those staff who were redeployed, which will um, bolster the existing teams um, who were continuing with our, our business as usual. Um, but I'm, I'll, I'll end I'll end there at that point, and I'm very happy to take any more questions on that, Chair. Thanks very much, Melanie. Um, and, and while I'm just asking, uh, waiting to see if anybody wants to make a comment, can I just myself um, firstly just uh, agree with you about the importance of looking after our staff who have been under, particularly in the last year, so much pressure, and uh, and, and really I think. What I've noticed as being chair of a new organisation in the last year is the importance that has been attached by yourself and your senior team in supporting staff uh, and having particularly the, the, the very regular, well attended staff briefings I've been, I've been very impressed with. Uh, and again, just to reiterate the thanks for, for Hilary Byrne to, to agree to take on that responsibility as well being guardian uh, for the uh, for the board level leadership required uh, for that. So, so thanks to both of you for that. Um, I've got Rob. And then Mark. Thank you very much indeed, um, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, particularly pleasing, Chair, to hear Melanie's comments about the importance 
and the priority attached to staff well-being and support. I think it's been a very, very tough year for everybody. It's probably gone on longer than people might have imagined at the outset. So it's, it's pleasing to hear the support that we are providing and we need to continue to, to do that. Uh, and similarly, I'm very pleased to hear that uh, Hillary has been appointed as our well-being guardian. I think that's a great uh, appointment. Um, there was just a comment I had on um, Melanie's report, um, and it's the statement about how well the whole system in Norfolk and Waveney is working together. Uh, again, from my perspective as a lay member, it was very pleasing to read that comment and to know that everybody is working successfully in partnership uh, and we would want that successful partnership working to carry on into the future. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. So I think I'll ask Mark to make comments and then Melanie can come back um, to answer both comments. Uh, Mark? Thank you, Anoop. Melanie, I was just wondering on the first item in your report, the pressure on the system, are there any particular pressures in Norfolk and Waveney which make us appear to be an outlier or are they pretty consistent nationally, those pressures? Thank you, um, Mark. And, and, and I'll also mention, say something about um, Rob's comments as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very good question, Mark. I think prior to the pandemic, we saw significant pressure in particular areas where we, we we weren't doing as well as other areas, particularly um, around emergency urgent care pressures, where we um, you know re repeatedly have struggled in this area. Um, much has changed. Some things have changed during the pandemic, but I would say there's still a lot of work for us to do in that area. I think there are other other aspects as well where we weren't necessarily. Um, doing well where, where there were pressures and there are they remain pressures and we'll hear more about that um over coming months as well around the uh, mental impact on mental health care for our population on me, on people's mental health and particularly that of children and young people we didn't bench we didn't compare well in this area before the pandemic and and things uh, whilst there have been many improvements and transformation and particularly additional investment, significant investment has gone into this area, but this still remains uh, a, a real pressure for the system and an increasing pressure for, for the system. Um, so I will just call out uh, those, those, those two. We know as well our waiting list, um, and I think John is gonna to touch on the planning and restoration um, later on in the agenda, but we know our long, we had long waiting lists before the pandemic, and those have, you know, we're now, you know, we now, they've now clearly deteriorated even further. Um, and again, um, I think other areas have deteriorated as well, but, you know, our starting position was, was not good for this area. So there are a number of things where we have much work to do. And I'm pleased that the collaboration that we've seen and the improved collaboration, significantly so, um, really puts us in the best possible place to be able to make the biggest impact and improvement on that. So working relationships are very strong and the way teams have come together, putting putting um, the greater good first ahead of what might be right for their own organisation and people first has just been really outstanding. Um, and, and, and Rob, just, you know, back to, to your comment on that. I mean, the most recent area, again, I would like to just comment on, well, maybe two. One is how groups of GP practices have come together. We mustn't overlook the fact that GP practices, individual businesses, um, very early days for primary working in a network but prior to the pandemic, and the way the GP practices have come together in networks, um, that's all part of an integrated care system has been just really significant improvement and progress. I'm um, really humbled by what they have done, um, which is beyond my uh, expectation, frankly, I think. Um, and, and the other, other example, maybe the other end of the spectrum is the critical care networks across Norfolk and Waveney. The way the three trusts and the critical care teams have worked together is just incredible. 
They've looked after patients from outside of our region. They've worked as a single team um, and, uh, you know, in, in, in quite significant adversity. We've had some of our CCG registered nurses deployed into those teams as well. Um, and they really, really have come together to look after the Norfolk and Waveney population extremely well. Thanks, Melanie. Right. Th um, thank you, Melanie, for your um, for, for your update. Um, and um, particularly, I think Mark's comments on system pressures and your response segues nicely onto the next item, which is which is to look at some of the um, the to give you an update on the current pressures facing the, the system, particularly in the light of uh, of the pandemic. Um, so I'll ask uh, Mark Burgess to uh, to start the discussion on, on that paper. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair. And uh, so I'll, I'll begin and, and my colleague uh, Joss, Jossie will uh, also add uh, as well. Uh, I, I won't pick out uh, or go through all of the paper. I'm sure you've read it all in detail, but uh, I think there are some points that I would like to, uh, uh, to, to kind of stress and focus on. So building on what's already been discussed around system pressures, absolutely what an extreme year, I think, was the phrase you used, Melanie, and it certainly has felt that. So ju just for, for context, uh, that the paper does talk about the cases across Norfolk and Waveney of, of COVID-19 and across Norfolk uh, and Waveney it's just shy of 40, 000, uh, 50,000 have, have been confirmed up until the 19th of March which is a very significant number uh, and while the rate per 100,000 was less than other areas uh, of the country uh, it certainly didn't feel like that uh, from, for, for, it's the feedback that we've had from our teams and the pressures that we felt across the system. Very sadly, uh, we've had uh, 1,591 deaths uh, uh, re relating to COVID-19 and 624 of those uh, were, were in care homes. So uh, really kind of uh, numbers that I think will strike a chord with all of us, uh, uh, just how severe uh, and what a big impact this has had on the population, the people of Norfolk and Waveney, but also on our services. Some more positive news around that pressure. So in on the 15th of January, we had 80, uh, 800 people being treated in hospitals after acute hospitals across Norfolk and Waveney. Uh, and as of uh, last week, that was down to 21. So that is positive, uh, positive news. And we are seeing a continued reduction uh, in terms of COVID related pressures. But we have we're very mindful that we've seen the pressures build uh, and subside before. So we are very mindful of that. Uh, Knock-on impact, of course, there are many. Um, one of those, uh, with the, there's a paper coming up later, and I know John's going to discuss this more, but I can't can't not mention it. Uh, the recovery of our elective care uh, uh, program, uh, elective care for patients, is an absolute priority. Um, we were in single figures a year or so ago of those patients that were waiting over 52 weeks. Uh, we're close to uh, approaching 10,000 now so that's just you know a, a numbers that we never dreamt that we would be reporting to governing bodies uh, certainly a year and a half two years ago um, so i think that just adds some context as well general practice uh, really has stepped up i mean i've been working very closely with general practice over the last year uh, and, and i've been uh, overwhelmed really by just how um, primary care general practice has really stepped up as with all areas uh, across the health and care sector to, to support the, the effort uh, and support patients. Uh, and um, w when they're playing such a large role around the vaccination program as well that Kath's going to talk about, it, it's really pleasing and encouraging to see that, that, that actually that, that those seven day services being delivered by primary care uh, and in January over half a million appointments, uh, a great deal of those delivered face to face, 67% uh, face to face, 28% by telephone. Uh, which compares a, a higher face-to-face -face rate with nationally, but trying to make sure we get the balance right so the patients can, can be seen. But I think I would just like to add, I think it's, as with all areas, it is taking its toll um, you know, through various um, Teams meetings that we spend our days on these days. Uh, you can see it in the faces of people. People are getting very tired uh, and uh, it's really taking its toll. So we. As, as we've described already, well-being of all of our staff is a, a really important part to this. And then finally, uh, around mental health, um, uh, the paper talks about pressures on those services. Uh, we have seen an increase in referrals and demand on those services, uh, as we might expect, uh, which has proved, uh, 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 and this is something we expect 
uh, to continue for some time yet. Uh, but encouraging, it's really positive to see some of the work that's ongoing, for example, around our primary care networks now working far closely with the Mental Health Trust, which I think is a real positive for the future. So they're just a few points that I was quite keen to kind of pull out of the paper. Uh, and Josh, I'm sure you'll like to add, add some comments and thoughts as well, and I'm very happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So, I mean, Mark's sort of given a really good update in terms of where we are with the majority of our COVID figures. Um, just want to drop down a layer to some of the local authority rates because, um, you know, whilst overall our rates are decreasing, which is fantastic, and Mark gave a really good indication of, you know, not even eight weeks ago, um, you know, our figures for, for Norfolk were, were sort of well over 470,000 per 100 population, you know, and, and, and now, you know, we're, we're down to sort of somewhere around 37. So that's fantastic. But but we are seeing because we're increasing testing in schools and also businesses, um, we are seeing some of the figures by, lo by local authority area starting to plateau or even go up slightly. Um, we've yet to really understand what impact the easing of lockdown is going to have. Um, and, and I think we're sort of just, just watching and waiting, almost holding our nerve on that really to see if that has a, a detrimental impact. Um, you've, you've got the updated figures by local authority area, I think to the 19th of March, just some real moves and shakers on that. Um, so, uh, so Norfolk's figure's gone up slightly, just, just above 37. Um, but again, you know, eight weeks ago, um, you know, the rate for Norfolk was at 472. So again, let's not per 100,000. So, so, so let's take that within context. Um, Breckland's gone up to somewhere around 96, which again is quite a significant rise. But, you know, because the numbers are quite small, even even one or two or three more cases will, will, will shift that figure up quite exponentially. Um, but we've got some really good progress across. So Great Yarmouth is down to 13.1, South Norfolk's down to 10.6. So the numbers are going in the right direction. And just looking over the border into Suffolk, you know, our East Suffolk figures, they're now down to 22.4 per 100,000 population. And again, back in January, they're at 424 per 100,000 population. So, you know, the figures are heading in the right direction. We just need to, as I say, just, just hold our nerves and, and, and keep an eye on, on sort of should those figures begin to rise. Um, nothing really more to add, Chair, but I'm happy to take questions along with Mark. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Mark and Jossie, for that. Um, and I, I see Tracy's hand up um, for a question. Yeah, kind of a question and a comment almost. So in respect of kind of those district level figures, I, I am, you know, I'm aware that as we're moving through the roadmap, we, we do know that they will fluctuate. And I think um, from my perspective, sort of been involved in one of the, the, the high risk community cells and certainly working very closely with the districts. There is a, a really good plan in place both for Norfolk and Suffolk for a local outbreak management plan to kind of, you know, how we work forwards with our districts, with our um, council, with public health in order to kind of manage those outbreaks and kind of, you know, work with communities. So I know just he's fully aware of that and involved in that but I think you know nobody's complacent and we're all working together and I think it's just an important point to make about those collaborations across the system. Okay thank you. Um, so shall I ask Do uh, Doris did you want to make a comment or question? Yeah it, it was, th thank you um, it was just a question um, in relation to the figures and the, the variation between the different um, district um, authorities. Um, do we have sort of uh, any insight into, you know, certainly why somewhere like um, Breckland and Kings Lynn, the figures are kind of higher and above the outliers because it's, I mean, I, I, I understand things are moving, but if, if there is sort of um, any learning that we can do to try and um, get those figures back down to um, be like the rest of Norfolk and Waveney um, and lower probably. If possible. So um, what we know now is this is largely due to community transmission. So there's no one big outbreak that we can hang our hat on. Whereas at the start of the pandemic, there were sort of a number of significant outbreaks that really sort of affected the numbers. Um, so I suppose the short answer is we 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 don't have a single a single sort of lesson learned really that we that we can take forward. Um, having said that, you know there's, there's there's a lot that we do know around how the virus spreads and we know that where there are areas of, of, of sort of health inequalities um, that has a correlation between the, the, the sort of figures in and of themselves. So we're doing a lot of work with, with sort of uh, the local authority to identify and reach out to some of those harder to reach groups to, to encourage them not only to get tested but also to, to come forward for the vaccination. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I was just a bit surprised. I mean, pleasantly surprised to see, you know, the, the figures from Yarmouth have, have dropped significantly, which is fantastic. But, sort of, you know, throughout the period, you know, Breckland, Yarmouth and Kings Lynn, they were kind of neck to neck on, on a lot of these figures. And, you know, I suppose the question is, you know, what, what, what has worked really well in Yarmouth that maybe we could, um, you know, do similarly in Breckland and Kings Lynn to get the figures down? Um, I, I, I think it is worth saying, as I say, the figures the figures look quite stark, but the numbers themselves are quite small. So it's not that Yarmouth are doing anything significantly different to, to West Norfolk and, and, and Breckland. It's just that, you know, were we to look at these figures next week, they, they could swing the other way because the numbers are quite small. So, um, as I said, in and of themselves, they look quite stark, but, but I don't think we can sort of heavily focus on, on sort of one week's worth of figures and, and, and put too much, read too much into it. Yeah, no, I completely uh, agree. And then you just bear, bear in mind that each of those areas probably have a couple, about 200,000 maybe population. So over seven days, what those actual numbers, when you think about kind of the, so how, how many people being positive does that represent? It's probably not, not far off the actual numbers that are there in terms of rates. So, so they, are, they are very much small numbers currently, which is, which is great to hear. Um, Mark? Uh, Thanks very much, Chair, um, and thank you very much for the paper, which was really helpful. I just had a question on the general practice section where you talk about the improvements in the provision of service forced on us by COVID, uh, which we've talked about in this me in these meetings before. I was just wondering, is any work underway to embed the very best of those practices across the whole of the, of the whole of Norfolk and Waveney? Uh, yes, Mark, uh, absolutely. I think um, they tell us themselves, those working in primary care and in general practice, that they don't want to go back in many of these these respects. Uh, and, and I know I've been quoted here as before as saying kind of five years of uh, progress made in, in, in five weeks at the beginning of the pandemic. But but I think that that's testament to the work of the teams and you know working with the digital team at the CCG as well when we've got the the, the, the kit out and uh, and um, just being able to, to to connect with people more virtually in the digital environment. It doesn't suit everyone, but I think now we're beginning to find. Uh, a new balance and I know we've got primary care colleagues and GPs on the line who also probably have a view and wish to wish to comment but yes I think um, we, we're already finding that we're maintaining a, a level of service uh, around new ways of working um, and uh, it's definitely won't go back uh, I think is, is the com common message for all uh, but we're also speaking we're speaking to our associate directors feed getting feedback from our clinical directors and practices about what's worked well what's worked less well what are you really keen to hold on to and maintain as we go forward and what would we like to change uh, uh, further still so I, I think it's a continuous uh, a process here Mark but yes most definitely uh, work is afoot around that. Okay, um, Rob, I see your hand was next, but Arden's put a hand up. Arden, can I just ask, was yours, just to get flow, was it was it in relation to the general practice point that Mark was asking about? Yes, it was, yeah. Would you like to make a comment then? Because so I, I, ju I was just going to really, um, to, to reiterate what Mark was saying around um, the, the possibilities of, of working digitally and how that's affected us in general practice. I think it has enabled us to work so much more efficiently with patients. Um, response times have massively improved so that most people can get expect to have a response within the same day. And that's been that's very much appreciated by patients. I think it's also enabled us to use much more effectively the wider members of the primary care teams, particularly thinking about our extended roles. Um, Previously, patients would have just booked in to see a GP without really realising potentially that those people were in post. So, so that's been great. My only caveat would be that I don't think it works so well for some GPs and other clinicians. So I, you, I am aware of colleagues who really do struggle with it. So I think moving forward, we need to find a way that suits everybody and, and can play to all of our different strengths. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Rob, I've got do you like to do, do you want to talk about the general practice side or I... yes, thank you, Chair. I was going to make a similar comment to to Mark really. Um, and, and Mark, thank you very much indeed for the report. It was very helpful. 
Um, and it was the comment around patients being very positive about some of the changed way, ways of working in, in primary care. And again, that made me think, well, this really gives us something to build on for the, the future. And it's interesting to hear Arden's uh, comments in that respect as well. Uh, and clearly the priorities that you've highlighted, Mark, around the restoration of um, elective care work and also the impact uh, on mental health services are important areas for, for us to continue to work on going forward. Thank you. Okay, um, great. Just mindful of time. Um, I've got Doris and then Hillary. Uh, and then if, uh, unless there's um, other comments that people are desperate to make, we'll probably leave the debate after the next two questions and points. So Doris first. Um, it's, it's back to the primary care and the new ways of working. Um, I would just urge any you know plans going forward to actually hear the patient experience voice, because at the moment, you know, if, with people working from home, the flexibility of waiting for a call is much higher. But when people start returning back to work, I mean, my, my practice, you know, you have no idea when they're going to call you back. And that might not work when reality, you know, the new normal returns. So I would just urge um, listening to the patient's voice as well. Thank you. Hilary? Um, thanks, yeah. I was just going to say, really, having the right kit has been absolutely crucial in, in making this work. So um, thanks really to the to Anne and, and the team for getting things out to practices, really, because that has been really important. Um, I was also going to say it is really, really busy. It's, it's nice to see primary care reflected in your paper, Mark. Um, so in, in, in the way that it was, but it is really busy. I don't think actually we would manage with um, the way that we were working before. I think there would be very, very long waits um, if we were to go back to uh, maybe the more traditional model. So I think we really do need this flexibility in the technology in order to manage um, the workload. And I think patients, you know, they're getting very quick responses, which is, is excellent. And that's what we want to happen. Um, but I think in order to maintain that, we, 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 we just couldn't physically go back to the way that we were doing things before. Um, thank you, Hilary. Um, and I, I would certainly agree with that. And, and I think I made a comment at a previous meeting that um, one of the things that I've noticed in general practice is that the new ways of working, particularly using technology, have actually reached out to groups within our, within our population that previously weren't probably uh, uh, well served in terms of access, particularly younger people and working people. Uh, you know, actually, we, we we provide more accessibility to. So, really, underlining Hillary's point that if we if we try to go back to the previous way of working, we couldn't do that as well as reaching out to some of the groups who we previously weren't reaching, perhaps as well as we could have too. Um, so, I, I, do you want to come back, Mark, to, to for some final comments? Thank you, uh, Chair. Yes, just just picking up on all those points collectively, if I may. I think you're absolutely absolutely right. It's about getting the balance right. I know I made that comment already, and, and we do accept that for while some people this has been an exceptionally positive experience, some of the change hasn't suited all people. So when we're asking those questions, it's it's absolutely about as as, as colleagues have made made the points at this meeting about making sure that we're trying to get it right for for all of our population. Um, uh, and that's what we're, we will be looking to do. So thank you for the comments and feedback too. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to give Tracy the last word on this one. Yeah, I think I think Mark's just probably recapped it. So I was going to say, certainly we know that not all of our people are digitally enabled. So it's just remembering as well that we have great ways of re reaching people. We've got to remember everybody that, that we know we don't exclude people as well. So very, very important to remember. Great, thank you. So, so th thanks very much to Mark and Josh for the report, and, and thanks for the um, for the governing body for I think what was a, a good discussion that we had. Um, so, so let's move on to um, item eight, which we're going to spend a little bit more time, hopefully, on as well. Um, obviously, the one of the things that's been taking up a lot of the time of the whole system uh, is a vaccination program, um, particularly uh, in relation, uh, I think, to meeting the needs of all the population and particularly those those groups uh, that that traditionally don't have access to services and in particular to the vaccination program so i'm going to uh, are you there kath to start I the am. discussion on your uh, on this on this set uh, on this 
item on the agenda. Yes, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, so um, I, I, everyone will have received the report, but I'm delighted to be able to give some updates to the data that was presented in the report following the publication of um, the national data set at the end of last week. So in terms of um, the programme, it continues to develop rapidly and uh, adjust and become more agile to meet the needs of parts of our population. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Um, but uh, as of um, the Sunday, the 21st of March, um, we have now vaccinated 61% of all of our over 16 year old adults within Norfolk and Waveney. Um, they've all had their first dose. And that's compared to 52% of adults in England. And that 9% positive variance results in the fact that we remain fifth out of the 42 health and care systems across, across England, um, which is a really positive reflection of all of the work that's being done. Um, and what that translates into is nearly 517,000 doses of vaccine that have been given since the start of the programme. Um, and up in the week of the 21st of March, we delivered a staggering 68,359 vaccine doses of vaccines um, that week, which is um, remarkable. Um, and 99% of our over 70s now have received their second dose, their first dose, sorry. Um, and actually what it, the data translates to is 90% of our over 50 population have received their first dose of vaccine, which is compared at national level at 87%. And now 26% of our over 80 population have received their second dose. So we're continuing to make huge progress in that area. Um, we are continuing to focus our vaccination on the JCVI priority groups one to nine. Um, and to remind everybody that is all of those over the age of 50, those with serious underlying health conditions, um, carers um, and frontline health and care workers and people living in care settings. We do know um, that throughout April there will be a reduced supply of vaccine um, for the month, which is reflective of a national sourcing um, issue, which most people will be aware is in the public domain. But the important message is that we are confident that there is sufficient supply of, of doses for everybody who are due their second dose during April. Um, they will receive it. The second dose supply remains unaffected. And actually, April is really going to be a month of predominantly second doses. Um, we will continue to retain the position. We are not, um, unless we are given the national direction, we will not be vaccinating people in cohorts 10 and above, which are those under the age of 50. It's really important that our vaccine supply is prioritised for those within cohorts 1 to 9. So in terms of the delivery of the programme, um, what we have seen um, so far as a result of the outstanding work um, across our whole system is that there's been, as I said earlier, massive numbers of people vaccinated. But what we do need to recognise is that there are smaller numbers of people who are as yet to access the vaccination programme. Um, and it is requiring us to, to look at the way in which people can and are able and want to access the vaccination programme, such as what time of day or day of the week the, the um, vaccinations are available and looking at more bespoke approaches and offers for our population. So we do have a group um, working um, specifically on addressing inequalities within the um, uh, vaccination programme. Um, and uh, Tracy Williams, governing body member and Queen's nurse chairs the group. Um, we are using our experience of vaccinating people within the flu programme over the last few years to learn from. And we've also held sessions with different groups to understand what makes um, what what makes difference with people um, wanting to take up the offer of a vaccine, which includes myth busting and making the information available in accessible formats such as languages or easy read um, format. Um, we have had some um, outstanding examples of how um, accessible clinics have been made available for people with learning disabilities and severe mental illness. Um, so the James Paget um, has um, been it has had a very high profile with the the outstanding um, accessible clinic um, that they've offered for people with learning disabilities, um, and the Mental Health Trust NSFT have also provided 
accessible clinics for people with serious mental illness who may require a bit more time um, to talk through um, the vaccination programme and with both um, groups of people, those with learning disabilities and severe mental illness, they may, um, some people may require a much more um, calm, less high volume environment for them to comfortably have um, to be vaccinated and that's, as I say, has proved really successful. Um, also working in partnership with the Gypsy, Roma and Traveller communities and have had success in that area, working with um, the local authorities and also um, some contain outbreak management funding has been um, accessed to support site managers um, who are members of the community um, to be able to provide more information on the vaccination and support that community to um, seek out um, the offer of a vaccination. We know that carers um, are entitled, whether they're paid carers or informal carers. So there's been some great work taking place within the system trying to seek out those carers who we don't know about. So there is information about people who receive carers allowance, for example, or already marked down as a carer on their GP record. But we knew that there were high numbers of people who are informal carers that maybe nobody knew about. So the successful campaign supported by the EDP to try and identify people who are informal carers has resulted in um, a great number of people coming forward to um, identify themselves as a carer and be able to ac access the vaccination. And that, pro that process can still take place and there is still a link to the Norfolk County Council website um, within the paper so that people can um, register either online or um, on a 24 seven um, voicemail. Um, in terms of people who are homeless or rough sleep sleeping, the JCVI does recognise that people um, who are homeless or rough sleeping, uh, sleeping are actually more likely to have underlying health conditions, which would mean that they are eligible within cohort six to be um, vaccinated. So there is lots of work going on within our local system to seek out and offer in, a, in, a, in a, an appropriate setting um, for uh, vac people to be vaccinated within this group. And there's some great examples set out in the paper of working with local um, voluntary sector and statutory partners um, to find ways to access individuals and gain their trust and support um, to be able to provide that vaccination. And I think it's an example of us providing as a system a flexible and per person-centred approach for that group of our population who are really very important. The drop-in and mobile vaccination clinic. So this is an exciting um, development. We know that the vaccination uptake within Norfolk and Waveney has been really good um, and we've had high volumes coming through our vaccination centres across the whole of the Norfolk and Waveney system. But actually now we are getting down to the group of people where they, uh, they're they not necessarily going to just take up the offer in the same way that other groups of our population have. So we have now started rolling, trialling and rolling out dropping clinics where People can just arrive as long as they're within the cohorts one to nine. They don't need to make an appointment um, and they can be vaccinated. The paper sets out some examples in the Queen Elizabeth um, Hospital and Beckles. I am delighted to say that there was another pilot on um, Sunday within James Paget um, and they were able to vaccinate 180 people. So even though that's not massive volumes, I think the important message is that these are not people maybe that would have accessed the vaccination through a, a standard route. So I had feedback from the director of nursing that actually a number of this 180 um, group of people were not registered with the GP. They'd never seen the GP. They some of whom were part of the local traveller community. And there were some people who were homeless that came to the pageant. So this is where we now are focusing on maybe smaller volume, but much more accessible approaches for our population. Um, Protect Now, um, so we are continue, we've run a project to encourage people in cohorts one to four that haven't had their um, vaccine to come forward and that we're writing to them or texting people depending on their digital capability. And they're also being asked, would they like a vaccine, uh, an appointment to be vaccinated? And if so, then we facilitate that to happen. And at the moment, we're initially contacting around 12,000 people within those cohorts. If that proves to be successful, we will expand it to cover other groups. Finally, I just wanted to say, um, I think the work that um, the, the success of our vaccination programme to date has been down to the um, unrelenting commitment from our frontline colleagues. 
But I also wanted to mention local authority, police, fire service colleagues that have all helped with the delivery of this programme. Um, and also our CCG staff, who sometimes um, we, we don't necessarily remember to say, and I, I really would like to call out the associate directors that work with our primary care locality teams that have worked so hard. And then finally, I thought it would be a good opportunity to share with um, governing body the data that's come through today, actually, um, I'm just thinking in terms of the fact that we uh, we're vaccinating, vaccinating, vaccinating. It isn't just COVID. So within flu, we've uh, within our over 65 population for this winter, we've increased the number of people vaccinated by 10.8 percent for under the age of 65 who are eligible. We've increased it by 13.6 percent and pregnant women we've increased by 6.2 percent. And on top of that, our childhood vaccination program, despite lockdowns, despite the challenges we've had in the year, 95% target has been met within quarters one and two for the majority of our childhood vaccinations. So I just would like to end up by commending all of the staff that have been involved in the planning and delivery of these programs that have made such a difference to the health of our population. Thank you so much, I'll end there. Thanks very much, uh, Kath, for that uh, full report. Um, Kathy, um, your hand is up. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Kath. Um, a really um, informative presentation about a really exciting um, campaign and, and particularly, I think, encouraging to hear about the childhood vaccinations because that was a, a very worrying trend pre-COVID, wasn't it? Um, in, in relation to the COVID uh, vaccination campaign, um, I think the work that you're doing on addressing inequalities is really encouraging. Um, I did wonder, in Norfolk and Waveney, is there any requirement to particularly target black and minority ethnic communities or are they covered in the um, strategy that you have in place already? Thank you, Cathy. Um, th that is part of um, the strategy that we have, although we will always continue to, to look at areas to improve uptake within all different parts of our community. One of the um, examples um, which, uh, that I didn't mention um, is the bus. Um, it, was it was referred to in the paper, but I think as we speak, um, the bus, bus is being fitted out to be a vaccination bus. And our first location will be at one of the mosques in Norwich um, in order to I'm working very closely with um, with the mosque in order to support and encourage their um, their members to um, to come forward and be vaccinated, obviously, if they're within cohorts one to nine. But it but people of ethnic um, minority backgrounds is definitely an area of priority and focus. Um, and um, we continue to look for examples of ways in which we can take that forward on a constant basis. Another example is um, a discussion with um, somebody this morning is that one of the hospitals are identifying people from the different cultural backgrounds who are vaccinators with a view of then releasing those staff to be able to vaccinate across the um, North and Waveney geography to try and engage further with people from the from their culture or their um, the, where their um, their language might their first language might be one that relates better to the local population. So Every day there's a new opportunity and example, but we do definitely focus and priority prioritise the areas of a black and Asian minority background. Thank you. OK, thanks, Doris, for that question and for that answer. Kath, uh, Doris. Um, thanks for your report. It's really great to hear of all the initiatives that are being done, especially the hard to reach groups. Um, I, I have two questions. One is in relation to the, um, the rollout to um, people with learning difficulties. I mean, it's, it's fantastic hearing what's happened at, um, at the pageant because they have a unit where they can be calm. Are there plans to kind of roll that out across Norfolk and Waveney? Because obviously pageant is on the extreme east. Um, and the other question I have is in relation to um, workers that might be unregistered workers. Are they able to access because they might be unregistered and um, and not registered with the GP practice as well. Um, and my guess is that they are likely to be high risk because of the environments they're living in as well. Um, so how can we address um, that group? Thank you. Thank you, Doris. So in terms of the rollout of the Learn Disability Programme, so the Paget have not um, uh, 
restricted it to people from the Great Yarmouth and Waveney area. They, if people um, are, are able to travel and, and want to travel and that their care workers feel that it's appropriate, then they are um, able to access that clinic. Um, but also the bus as an alt so so there's some people might think that actually taking an individual with that level of need to a hospital setting may not always be the right answer for them as well. So um, NCH and C are going to be the lead provider for the bus and they have a learning disability team. So they are able to offer um, mobile um, learning disability accessible um, slots for people to be vaccinated outside of a, a typical health setting, which may um, be better for those individuals. So we're, we're taking a much more a creative and flexible approach um, to that group of individuals who are, it's really important that we enable them to be able to access, access the vaccination. What I will add though as well is that there are a lot of people with a learning disability that have accessed their vaccination through the normal routes, whether it's in PCNs, vaccination centres or hospital hubs, and that feedback has been that despite um, than being in those high volume environments that reasonable adjustments have been put in place, which has proven to be very successful. In terms of workers who are unregistered, um, they uh, people can access the vaccination um, if they're even if they're unregistered with the GP. And I think the Paget was a good example this weekend where people came forward that were not registered with the GP. Um, so what they're, we're able to do then is support people to act to be to register with the GP as well at the same time but not deny them access to a vaccine. We are, we're are we also looking at other um, types of um, environments for um, the bus. So for example, we have plans to go to um, trial at one of the um, food processing factories within um, Norfolk, um, which have a high volume of people, many of which may live in houses of multiple occupancy um, or again, be unregistered with the GP practices. So, uh, you know, basically any opportunity to vaccinate people within cohorts one to nine that are eligible, regardless of um, whether they're registered with the GP, um, we're seeking out opportunities for people to be able to easily access that vaccine. And we'll continue to look at that. And particularly as then we eventually go down the cohorts 10 plus, we probably will capture a lot more transient workers, particularly um, coming into the um, farming season with um, uh, food um, picking, fruit picking. Okay, thank you, um, Kath, for that full response. Um, Tracy? Yeah, um, I was going to add really certainly in respect of the inequalities work that we're doing, that it really is a whole systems approach to this work. So certainly, I know Kath mentioned our inequalities oversight group, so it absolutely is being led by the data, working very closely with our district council colleagues and our county council colleagues, public health. So we really know where in areas of the county, both Norfolk and Waveney, um, parts of Suffolk, where we do have that, that low uptake so we can work with communities. And certainly where the bus will go will be where, where we want, where it needs to go, where it can go and a very really important piece of the work is that we're working with um, the health equity partnership of NHS England to absolutely engage with communities and, and work with communities to tell us how they want the bus to work for them and to increase uptake of vaccines so that's all very very important and certainly you know our, our migrant workforce and um, you know our, our communities are, are really important to listen to, to what will work so we can absolutely ensure that everybody gets access to the vaccine and don't get left behind. Great, thanks. Um, thanks for that, Tracy. I certainly agree with all those comments. And thanks very much to um, Kath in particular for presenting the report and giving us such a full update. Uh, and in particular, without repeating anything that, sh that you said, Kath, I, mean, I think I, I do want to just extend the appreciation and thanks really uh, for uh, not just the face, uh, patient facing clinical providers, but also all the background, all, all the people uh, sort of supporting those services, including within the CCG, who've worked tirelessly to get to where we are today, which is actually, I think we should be quite proud of, of uh, the levels of vaccination that we've managed to achieve to date, uh, you know, amongst the highest in the country. And I think we should, we should and that's, that doesn't just happen. Uh, it's because of all the hard work that's been put in, including by uh, by, by uh, the CCG, as well as uh, all our providers, including particularly obviously general practice as well. And just I also wanted to just say with regard to um, having having seen some of the work that's been referred to in terms of addressing those uh, parts of our population or groups within our population who are traditionally hard to reach. I think, again, it's a really important piece of work and the number seems quite small, but actually we, we should remember 
uh, that these are the, the, the groups that are traditionally very hard to, to reach. And I think uh, uh, we, should, we should again be proud of the work that's been done uh, to, to reach out to those communities, particularly that always seem to miss out when, uh, when healthcare is provided. So th thank you for that. Um, let's move on to the next uh, agenda item, which is agenda item nine, uh, which is uh, to discuss the system approach to the restoration of services, particularly the financial planning. Uh, and John, you're going to give us an update. Um, and perhaps if you could, I know that the um, the planning guidance for 21-22 is now out. So any early sort of uh, reading of that would be would be uh, helpful as well. So over to you, John. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Newt. And conscious this item has been quite well trailed already during this meeting. So that the paper feels a little in inadequate, just being a couple of sides of, of update, really. But I think that reflects the speed at which things move sometimes. So at the time of preparing the paper 10 days ago, as it suggests, we were still waiting for all the planning guidance, the financial envelopes and associated guidance for 2021-22. That was published at the end of last week after the NHS England board meeting. So we've got an awful lot of information now that we're digesting, we're understanding what it means, and then there'll, there'll be a whole planning process for us to go through which culminates really in finance activity, workforce returns being submitted to NHS England around the 6th of May. So we've got kind of a six week planning process that we're just about to, to embark on. So just a few things to mention. Um, if I just pick up money first, um, subject closer to my heart, I suppose. So I'd suggested in the paper for the governing body that the indications previously were that the current financial regime will be rolled over into the first quarter of the new financial year. The guidance confirms actually it's being rolled over into the first half. So for the first six months of 2021-22, we'll have a, ver a very similar arrangement to what we've currently got, which is broadly speaking, fixed financial envelopes for each system with appropriate levels of funding to top up um, to make sure that each organization's costs are covered and also that the costs associated with dealing with COVID are covered. So that, that's welcome clearly, that it means as we continue to, to deal with the impact of the pandemic, um, and the vaccination campaign and everything that goes with it, um, money shouldn't be an issue in terms of, of being able to deal with those operational imperatives. I think it's worth flagging though with that, that from October onwards, we're, we're very much expecting a return to something that looks much more like business as usual from a financial point of view. And there's, there's lots of um, messages coming out from the centre about the fact that there will be a need clearly to look at efficiencies, productivity, transformation within systems because the level at which we're spending within the NHS at the moment is significantly higher than it is normally. Indeed, the settlement, I think, for the first six months of the year includes an extra £6.6 .6 billion pounds nationally um, for the NHS, plus an extra £1.5 one billion for electric recovery. So it shows very significant sums of money still coming through. So in terms of the financial plan, we'll obviously do work on that. We'll, we'll take it through the Finance Committee in April and May, and then bring something back to the governing body in May to um, to, to summarise the financial plan for the next six months and the operational plan as well. We're hoping for further guidance for the second six months of the year, obviously to be issued probably at, towards the end of the first quarter of 21-22, so we've got a sense of where we're headed within those last six months. But as I say, we're, we're, we will be looking at that and planning on that at the same time, recognising that it's going to reintroduce for us, I think, some of the financial challenges that we were facing before COVID hit. So turning to, um, I suppose, the main aspect of the guidance that came out in terms of operational planning, what if it's just worth calling out the six key priorities that were listed within there? Um, I would encourage governing body members actually to read the, the planning guidance. It's only 20 pages, actually, that the main operational and planning guidance document. There's further documents clearly around implementation and some of the detail, but, but the, the key document articulates the priorities well. So there's six priorities. The first one, I think you'd be pleased to hear from previous discussions today, actually, the first priority is about supporting the health and well-being of staff and taking action on recruitment and retention. And this reflects, um, to a large extent, the fact that staff are clearly extremely tired across the NHS from the work that's been done during the pandemic and the need for staff to take leave to have some rest and recuperation um, at the same time as trying to restore services. So health and well-being of staff, of staff is the first priority. The second priority is around COVID, so it's continuing to deliver the vaccination programme and to meet the needs of patients with COVID-19, and that's recognising some of the ongoing implications, things like long COVID. The third priority is um, another huge one, actually, so it, it's about restoration of services, 
and it's it's framed about building off what, what we've learned during the pandemic, which I think talks to some of the system working that we've mentioned earlier in this meeting and about transformation, the rapid transformation that's happened through digital and, and other such approaches. So to, to accelerate the restoration of elective and cancer services and also to manage the increasing demand on mental health services. So that's the third priority. And to support that, the, um, the settlement for the NHS included one billion pound for supporting elective recovery. So the expectation of the NHS is that to start with, we get back to 70% of our historic activity levels in April, then increasing gradually to 85% by July. But then if we can do over and above that, the funding is there to be able to cover the costs associated with doing more work. So a real incentive there to systems to really look at what extra capacity we can release to enable us to start making some inroads into the, the very, very large backlogs that, that were mentioned earlier. So that was the third priority. The fourth priority is about expanding primary care capacity to improve access to local health outcomes and address health inequalities. And that's to some extent building on some of the work that has been started in recent years anyway about PCN development. The fifth priority is around transforming community and urgent and emergency care. And again, that, that's a perennial priority really within the NHS and, and that's focused on preventing inappropriate attendance at emergency departments, improving um, timely admission to a hospital for patients that present at emergency departments and then need admissions and also reducing length of stay. And that's focusing on areas such as NHS 111 first, which has been piloted again during the pandemic and um, it seems to be having some success, I think, at diverting patients from emergency departments where they don't need to go there. And it's also looking very much at a two hour urgent response in the community. Again, to try to make sure that patients are kept safe and well at home and don't then end up coming to a hospital. Um, then the sixth priority finally is about working collaboratively across systems to deliver on all the other priorities and really in a nutshell that's talking about the developments of integrated care systems from April 22. So some of the work that Melanie referred to earlier and huge amount of transitional work um, to transform the CCG towards the ICS body from April 22, transform the way we work across the system to develop provider collaboratives, um, to develop our place-based work and a whole range of things associated with becoming an ICS. So um, quite a lot in there and there's all, obviously an awful lot of detail underneath each of those priorities that I've just kind of given a little flavour of there, um, but that's, that's where we're at with planning at the moment. So I'll pause there, I'm very happy to try and field any questions. Okay, thanks. Um, th thanks, John, for um, that update. Um, any any questions or co or comments? Yep, yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, John, thanks for the update. I had a scan through the operational planning guidance, and it's a very readable document. So, I, in that sense, I can commend it. Um, I know you're going to digest and work this in the weeks ahead, as you said. Uh, did I read correctly, as you said, there is an incentive scheme on the elective recovery, but no penalty scheme, is that how I read it? That's correct, Hein, and there, there is, there's a line in the guidance, can't quite remember what it says, but it, but it does basically confirm that it's a one-way scheme this time, which is different to what was originally put in place in, in the current financial year. So yes, that there is an incentive there to do more work, but there is no penalty if we don't achieve the baseline. Yeah, thanks. Okay, any, any other questions or comments on that? No? Okay. In that case, we'll, we'll move to um, the next item, um, which is 10, um, and it's um, a, a regular standing item every month to um, review uh, clinical threshold policies, uh, new ones, um, approved, uh, revised ones and ones that, that come up for a review, which we need to be um, approving as a governing body. And I think hopefully we've got Mark on the meeting to talk to that item and those recommendations. Uh, thank you, Anoop. Um, uh, for those, uh, for the benefit of those who are perhaps watching this meeting on YouTube and perhaps haven't seen some of the other meetings, I'll quickly explain that we developed the clinical policies uh, using a, a group of clinicians, uh, including the sort of deputy medical directors of the, of the three 
hospitals and, and some GPs. And then once they've uh, drafted a policy, it goes out for further consultation amongst other GPs and other clinicians who may have a specialist interest in those particular policies um, in the various hospitals and other providers. And it comes back uh, to this meeting for, for approval. Um, so there's a, a slightly longer list of policies this time compared to previously uh, because we've held some over from the previous governing body. Uh, I would then plan to go through each and every one of them in great detail because hopefully committee members will have the chance to have reviewed those and and considered any feedback they wish to give. Um, I would just like to highlight a couple of things. So uh, first of all, there's obviously a new policy in relation to laser hair removal and we've developed that after a review by public health um, which was triggered by some individual funding requests and so as committee members we went we get individual funding requests in an area repeatedly we go on to develop a policy in relation to that so the policy for that hopefully um, you can see reflects what we've received and secondly the varicose veins policy which is you know a, a tightening of the policy but you will see the rationale behind that policy in the paper so very happy to take questions either on the process or the policy themselves. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. And, and thanks, Mark, for giving the background to particularly for those members of the public who are, who are in the meeting. Um, so are there any um, any comments or questions on those um, those recommendations that have been made? Uh, we'll take them as a whole. Uh, John. Just a general question, please. Um, Mark, in reading the, the paper, I, I couldn't particularly see anything that looked like it was going to have any major financial implication, but I just wanted to ask that question. Is there anything within there in terms of changing policy that you think is going to have any particular material financial implication? Uh, no, I don't, John, because the uh, so the new policy is, is also one that we've received the IFR request for, and so the policy is, is, is basically in line with what we did approve for that process. So, we so we would we'd expect the, the same activity to be uh, to to occur and therefore the cost incurred but perhaps via a different route. Um, the the varicose vein policy is tighter, but the reasons for that is described in the paper, and so we probably won't see a financial reduction in our spending because of of waiting list uh, considerations because of that. So uh, I think that's how I'd summarise the potential financial impact. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for that question and answer. Are there any other questions or comments people want to make on the uh, recommendations before we approve? Okay, so can I can I ask you then to um, approve those um, recommendations made on clinical threshold policies as set out in the paper? Okay, thank you. So that, that's approved. Um, so item. 11. Um, similarly, uh, we've got Michael Dennis, uh, who's going to give us the, re the review and approved recommendations to drugs and therapeutics um, within Norfolk and Wave Meath. Um, so, Michael, are you on the call? Hello, Anoop. Yes, thanks very much. Um, so I'll take the paper as read, but, but perhaps by way of background similar to what Mark just um, explained. Um, the uh, business cases and NICE guidance and any other regional guidance um, comes into our area prescribing committee called Norfolk and Waveney um, Therapeutic Advisory Group or TAG. Um, they make commissioning, oh, sorry, they make um, evidence-based recommendations, clinical recommendations based on evidence and that goes to our Drug and Therapeutics Committee who look at um, the commissioning position and engage with trusts around pathways because when um, NICE declares a, a new drug uh, an option and there's other drugs uh, declared as options then we, we just need to agree with our local clinicians uh, the pathway and what criteria they'll use and so we can set up um, commissioning arrangements for those drugs. Um, so they go there then then we take them to our clinical executive committee which has um, a lot of GP representation for a discussion and then they come here for final ratification so that we can say we've made a commissioning decision um, and occasionally we have to um, 
Uche's action if we're falling outside of a nice timetable, which we have done on a couple of items. Um, other than that, I don't have anything particular to highlight on the paper. So um, uh, any questions, comments or, on the process, etc., are invited. OK, so I'll welcome comments and um, to avoid John asking the question, can I ask you if there are any uh, any recommendations which have a significant material financial impact? I have highlighted, I think, in previous papers, the um, NICE TA607 around rivoxaban in uh, preventing atherothrombotic events um, it is in the region of 150 to possibly 200,000 pounds um, in the first year. Um, but we have agreed um, limiting this to um, higher risk patients with the local cardiologist. So I think that one's been highlighted. The um, subcutaneous migraine biologic drugs, so uh, galcanizumab, kind of a monthly injection at home that patients administer themselves instead of Botox, may may shift a little bit of um, cost in terms of because currently there um, some patients, some of these patients might be using Botox, which is in a block contract at the moment, so that might mm -hmm. shift some cost out of the block contract, um, but it won't be significant for many months. Okay, thank you. Um, any uh, any questions or comments for Michael? Okay, uh, in that case, we're asked to um, review and approve the recommendations that have been made uh, in the uh, in the agenda item. So, can I ask you to approve the recommendations? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. That's approved. Thank you. Um, so, item. 12 um, is uh, an update on the position with regard to finance for month 11. Uh, so that's John's finance report. Thank you, Chair. So yes, as you said, it's position 11 months into the financial year and, and the forecast position for the year end that we're obviously just about to, to go into. Um, just a reminder, the financial regime um, in the second half of this year, we referred to it in the previous paper on planning. Um, fixed um, system financial envelopes with additional funding to cover system top ups of costs and also COVID. So the, the expectation is that the NHS costs at an organisational level are covered um, so that organisations could focus on the pandemic and broadly we're in that place as a system and as a CCG. So you'll remember from previous reports that when we did our planning for the second half of this current financial year as a system, we thought we were going to have a gap of about 19 million pounds within which the CCG was expecting a gap of around 5 million. And that was on the basis that we were hoping and planning, expecting at the time to restore elective services to really make inroads into the, the waiting list that we've discussed earlier. In reality, that hasn't happened for, for very clear reasons because of the impact of, of the pandemic. And so therefore, Rather than showing a deficit as a system, we're looking to be in a much more positive financial position, as in um, achieving a break even position or maybe a surplus. And the CCG is in a similar position as well. So basically, money that we'd had set aside to, to pay for some of that um, restoration of elective work just hasn't been able to happen. Um, so we're expecting at, at year end as a CCG to deliver a break even, maybe a small surplus. That's considered to be a low risk situation. We've discussed that through the Finance Committee. Just a couple of other comments I would make on the paper. So um, one section of the paper talks about COVID related costs that we incur, some of which we charge off to NHS England centrally. Just to say that there's a national programme to audit CCGs and providers um, just to review the way that we're capturing COVID costs and claiming those throughout the, the financial year. Um, we've been audited as part of that. The results of that audit process will be presented to the audit committee in April, but I'm, I'm pleased to say that there's been no major issues that have arisen as a result of that. And the other thing to point out, um, section five at the end of the report, very last paragraph, it's talking about our allocation, our funding as a CCG. And I think it's worth pointing out actually that we've had 250 million pounds worth of extra non-recurrent funding, one-off funding coming to, to the CCG on behalf of our local health and care system this year. And that's due to the financial regi regime that we've talked about. So I think recognising that that's flowing through simplistically to cover costs of the system. It's pointing at the sort of financial challenges that we may have after COVID um, when the regime is likely to be a bit different and we're not likely to get the same level of non-recurrent financial support. So in, in summary, it's a positive financial position for 2021, but um, hints of clearly more challenges to come in the future. Happy to take any questions. 
Okay, thank you for that um, report. So, and any questions or comments for uh, for John? Um, Rob? Yes, thank you, Chair. And, and um, I wanted to say, John, thank you for the report. I think a break-even results for the year, given everything that's happened and all of the uncertainties that we face, that'll be a tremendous result for the CCG. Uh, and all credit to you and the team for steering us through this um, very challenging year. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, so if there aren't any any further comments or questions again, um, thank you. Thank you for that report, John. Then it is certainly uh, you know, one of our statutory responsibilities, isn't it, to not overspend. Um, so, so that's a very comfortable position to be in at this stage at month 11. So thank you for your uh, efforts on that. Um, let's move to the next item, which is uh, 13. Um, and Karen is going to give us uh, a review of the current uh, governing body insurance framework uh, and setting out uh, some of the current risks that the organisation faces. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, the um, governing body assurance framework is here, um, setting out the key risks uh, for the organisation. Um, as, as per the usual process, uh, this has been reviewed by our senior management team and also reviewed by the executive uh, management team. Um, there are a few changes which are just summarised at the end of the uh, paper, including um, setting a few completion dates uh, where we hope to have uh, some of these risks completed as, although you, the board will note, um, the nature of them, it is very difficult in some instances to, to set that out. Um, well, there's also been a few changes uh, since uh, last time to some of the uh, ratings of the risks, again uh, reviewed by SMT and EMT and uh, officers are, are happy to take any specific questions you have on that. A um, couple of points just to highlight. Um, the uh, risk owners, we have director level uh, uh, risk owners for the uh, GBA, and one of our directors has moved to a secondment. So there is a holding position currently with some um, directors holding the fort on some of those risks uh, just for the short interim period. Um, and also there is a specific risk that we're going to be reviewing. EMT would like to review further uh, to do with uh, rack plank, which I appreciate might be a term that um, some of you in the public are not familiar with. And um, John Ingham is able to um, explain that a little further if, if anyone requires a bit more explanation on that. I've, I've definitely sidestepped that one. Um, if there's any uh, about any, if there's any other questions, then please do um, uh, let me know now. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so, John, do, do you want to tell us about rack plank? <laughs> Because I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't think I do. do I? Um, I'll happily mention a little bit about that. I'm, I'm trying to remember what RAC stands for, but but basically it, it's about the construction of the roof at both oh. the James Paget and the Queen Elizabeth hospitals. So there was a, a certain um, age and generation of hospitals, of which there's eight in the country, that were built around the 70s. Um, and the, the structure, the, the way that the roof was constructed, means that it, it exhibits kind of wear and tear over time. So depending on the state of upkeep of it over the years, depending on the, the pressures on the roof from water and, and other um, facilities that get put on the roofs, there, there's differential levels of wear and tear at the two hospitals. So um, there are risks, um, known risks that, that exist around um, underpinning of the roof, basically in, in both trusts. They've been addressed by those organisations and as a system, actually, we've received quite significant sums of capital funding this year to, to support that work. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And uh, of course, I, I was aware of that. I just forgot that term. Um, hi. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, I had a question on risk appetite on the um, the matrix charge, page 104 of the PDF pack. For the, for the highest risk referral to treatment, it says that we're fine with risk appetite of 20, which strikes me as very high. Um, and maybe it it warrants us for looking to make elective recovery to sort of uh, reconfirm the risk appetite levels in general for the various risks. Okay. Um, so who wants to who wants to comment on that uh, comment, 
from um, from high and around the risk appetites for um, being set at high. I think I can I can just comment there the risk owner. So I was just familiarising myself with the risk owner on that one. I think it might be uh, Kath uh, Byford, but any directors jump in if I'm wrong on that. But um, the risk appetite, I think you're referring there to Hein is the left hand uh, column there. I think that is really that's not the appetite as in what the organisation is happy with. It's more what the risk would be if we all did nothing about this, what would actually um, happen uh, and uh, what that level is rather than a risk that we're we're finding is acceptable. Um, so um, that's just the point of, of clarity there. Um, the risk that we're the current risk is what we're setting at, at at 16 there in the middle and the tolerated risk is ideally what we'd like to um what we'd like to see you know um in, in an ideal world um so I, I don't know if you want any further information on actually that risk and the work surrounding that and the, the director may be better placed to talk that through but that's just explaining i'll, I'll follow up uh, separately but thanks karen okay yeah, i think it might, it might be an idea to maybe have, have a discussion with kath or, or the appropriate manager on on the on the understanding of that particular risk um assessment um rob yeah thanks chair and, and thanks for the updates uh karen it's very helpful to see the paper uh i focused on the red risks and i think based on the discussions that we've been having um the red risks that you've identified in the documents are those that i would rate as red uh, and also just thanks to John for explaining what rack plank meant. That was a new one on me, uh, but I now understand that. Thank you, John. OK, great, thank you. Um, so if, th if there aren't any any further um, comments or questions, um, we'll, um, we'll not ask to approve anything. That was a review. Uh, so, so we'll move on to the next section um, of the agenda, uh, which is reports from the um, from the governing from the CCG committees. Uh, so 14 is um, the quality and performance committee, which Kath, you uh, you chair. Kathy, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll take the reports read. Um, in line with other committees, the Quality and Performance Committee have reduced the um, frequency and also the length of their meetings for the duration of the peak of the, the COVID wave, but we're now moving back to business as um, usual. Uh, We've done a piece of work looking at our risk register and trying to refine our risk still further. And there's a couple of areas that have been um, on the register and we're, we're going to do an in-depth review of them because we're concerned about the risk that they, they pose. And um, those are neurodevelopmental paediatrics and also eating disorder services. So we will be um, looking at uh, those areas um, in the next meetings to ensure that um, uh, progress is being made across them. And we've also had a look at system pressures and um, we're going to be doing some work on just trying to understand um, uh, potential harms that might have arisen uh, because of the focus on the COVID pandemic. Um, so that's the work of the Quality and Performance Committee. Happy to take any questions. Um, thank you, Cathy, for that. I, mean, I think it's a really good um, report that's set, setting out the work that your committee is doing. Are, are there any questions? No comments? No, okay, so um, item 15, um, the report from the Finance Committee, which Hein, you chair. Uh, thanks, Chair. I take a paper as read, happy to take any questions. Any questions from for Hein? No, okay, uh, and 16 is the report from the Primary Care Committee, which Doris, you chair. Um, similarly, I take the paper as read and happy to take any questions. Our focus has really been on COVID and um, keep keeping things going during this period. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, and um, similarly for 17, the report from the Audit Committee, which Rob, you chair. Yes, thank you, Chair. Again, I'm happy to take any questions. I'll take the paper as read. OK, so any questions? OK, um, so um, we've reached the, 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 the set out uh, agenda items and we're on to 18, which is uh, questions from the public. Um, so um, 
Karen, uh, I understand we had we've had one question which was sent out prior to the meeting. Is that is that right? Yes, there's been um, one question that um, was received yesterday. Um, we have just sent it uh, round to the governing body. Um, I wonder if I could ask um, Georgia, who's joined, just to share that with the governing body um, so that we have that on the, the screen um, and that also for the benefit of the public that has joined us. I don't know if as well the rest of the board is seeing that there's a strange uh, my screen has gone quite straight <laughs> with, with, with sharing. So um, we're just, uh, again, Georgia from Digital is just trying to fix that for us. OK, so, we, uh, hopefully, uh, right, so nice hopefully everybody can see those questions. Yeah. OK, so, so just give people um, just a, a, a half a minute just to read, read the question. OK, um, so uh, Karen, do you, do you want to make some initial comments on how we how we will yeah. respond? Yeah, um, so I think Arden um, is uh, is happy to make some some initial comments on this one. Uh, and uh, perhaps Arden, if you wouldn't yeah. mind. Thank you. Very happy to. Thank you. Um, so around the development of the community hubs, um, we already have the community hub uh, known as REST, which has begun digitally in Norwich. Um, the building works are still taking place, um, but we anticipate opening of the actual hub for face-to-face -face, um, sometime later on this year, once that's been complete. The hub in the West um, is currently um, being provided, the services being provided by MIND. Um, the contract has recently been awarded to Access Community Trust um, for that hub and in addition for a wellbeing hub in the east. Um, so Access Community Trust are picking that up at the moment and transferring staff over in the west. They will be providing the staff from within their from their own organizations. Um, they will be um, they will be providing therapeutic options such as around trauma work and coaching and mental health um, support um, alongside working with communities um, and so some of them are as I said already open and some of them are, are transferring over or progressing. They have a Access Community Trust has an excellent track record of working with people who have undergone mental health trauma and particularly dual diagnosis um, and they are confident that they will be able to recruit the staff required um, for the hubs to be up functional um, within the next month. They're also, we're also going to be working very closely um, with NSFT because part of what the functions of the hubs are going to be providing crisis provision, um, largely in the evenings, um, which will be open to referrals from all statutory services. Um, particularly from primary care, ambulance and the mental health teams. People will be able to go there as a place of safety and respite and work on de-escalating the crisis. Um, so, that, so that's the other uh, really important function of those hubs. And in the daytime, they'll be operating as well-being facilities um, with mental health support. In terms of the mental health practitioners, um, we are very well um, we're doing very well on our recruitment plan for some band seven mental health practitioners that will be aligned to our PCN network. So each PCN will be able to have a band seven mental health practitioner, some of whom are starting um, this month, some of whom are already have started as part of the, the pilots that we had running from last year. Every PCN will have a band seven working within them. Um, and in addition to that, they will also, by the end of the year, have a recovery worker who will be first contact mental health practitioners supporting the PCNs. In phase two, in wave two, which will be starting next year, there will be another wave of mental health practitioners also coming on stream to support that workforce. The uh, other 
parts of that mental health team will be peer support workers, um, who again we anticipate re recruit over the next year or so. We're working through how that recruitment for the recovery workers might take place. It potentially will be from procurement, but it may be that we can find another way to do it. We're currently working on, on that model. Um, in addition to that, um, we'll be linking in, those teams will be linking in with the social prescribers. And in addition with link psychiatrists for each PCN. Um, initially that, that might take the form of advice and guidance, but eventually each PCN should have access to advice from and um, support from a psychiatrist. IACT will also have a place within those teams and each PCN will um, be made aware of who their local IACT uh, representative who will hopefully be able to work within those spaces as well to support those teams. And finally, um, these teams will also be supported by the, a new CAP role, which is a clinical associate psychology role. And the UE, we're working with the UEA um, to support that. And we're anticipating that the first cohort of those people will be starting in the autumn. In terms of the mental health facility at Cromer Hospital, um, the, there is an ambition for an, an additional um, wellbeing hub um, both in the north and the south um, of, of our area. Um, uh, those talks are on, those discussions have started um, with some of the community leaders, but it's, it's early days at the moment and we need to work through the finance associated with that. Um, it hasn't yet been decided where those mental health facilities will be placed. I'm happy to take any questions on that. Um. Uh, well, first, first of all, um, thank you, Arden, for um, preparing uh, to answer the question and, and giving such a quick um, and, and, and thorough response and such uh, such a short space of time. Um, I mean, this was a member of, uh, of the public who's asked the question. So in terms of uh, of um, formally responding, I think we, we will write uh, and, and respond to the person that asked the question. And, and I think you're the answer that you've given will be the, 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 the main points that will be in, in, in that response, I guess. Um, uh, yeah. That's correct, Chair. Yeah. Um, we respond uh, directly to the person that asked the question. We also put the response um, on the website so members of the public can review the response as well. Yeah, OK, great. Thank you. Just to tell the Chair, we have had no further questions through the meeting via email. Oh, great, thanks very much for that, Karen, and for clarifying that. Um, so, and are there? I'm, I'm, I'm aware that there's still, I think, maybe a couple of people from from members of the public at the meeting. Are there any questions for those attending? No. Okay. Um, so um, we're on to the final item, which is any other business. OK, so if there's no other business, then I just need to remind you that the next meeting of um, of this uh, governing body is on the 25th of May at 1.30. On the agenda paper, it says venue to be um, arranged or announced. Um, I think we, sh we should assume that it will be in the same format as this meeting. I know uh, we're all dying for normality to come back and um, hopefully in, in June we will have some um, normality in terms of, of mixing, but I think we can assume that by the end of May uh, we should, uh, we will we'll still be conducting this meeting virtually, um, and that's on the 25th at 1.30. Um, so we'll, I'll close the meeting at this stage, 